there was a video that we put out uh, about a week ago that went through some of the pearls that I just want to quickly go over. But if you didn't have a chance to watch it, that's okay. I'm going to run through them right now. Um, I want to run through 10 quick pearls of COVID airway management. And then I really want to open this up to um, a question and answer forum uh, for, for the entire group. So uh, number one, the first pearl of COVID airway management. And, and Sean, if you could moderate, and if people want to type uh, questions or comments as I go through the 10 pearls, you know, please feel free to interrupt. <clears throat> Pearl number one, the fundamentals of basic airway management are completely unchanged. Uh, we recently did a simulation lab training at GBNC, followed by airway training in the operating room that Dr. Sago coordinated at Sinai for our EMS supervisors. And in that, we stressed the fundamentals of basic airway management, which in the COVID era remain largely unsha unchanged. BVM technique is ideal with two persons, one creating a seal, one squeezing the bag. There's two reasons for this. Number one, it's just good technique. You'll get a much more effective tidal volume. And number two, in the effort to prevent aerosolization, you really want to have a tight seal. So although we try to limit the number of people coming to the patient's side in the COVID era, there should be no hesitation of the senior medical person at the call, the person managing the airway, the EMS supervisor, to call for a second set of hands to do whatever and we should do two-person BVM ventilation whenever possible. We should be using basic airway adjuncts like MPAs or OPAs. We should be elevating the head of the bed whenever possible. Uh, managing airways flat is very 2000, and we want to elevate the head of bed whenever possible. If we're preparing to intubate, we want to align the ear to the sternal notch. We want to, whenever possible, use a peep valve, and I realize that peep valves are not available in Baltimore County yet, but they're coming and we want to avoid hyperventilation. So basic fundamentals of airway management in the COVID era have not changed. Number two, the HEPA viral filters. We want to use those whenever possible. We want to put them between the mask and the device. So if we're using a BVM, if we're using CPAP to do non-invasive ventilation, if we have an ET tube, we want it between the ET tube and the BVM. And then we want to use the other things that are put out in the field guide to kind of cover the BVM or whatever we're using to oxygenate or ventilate the patient to prevent stuff from spraying out of the patient's mouth. The HEPA filters alone are not going to save your life and prevent you from getting COVID. You have to use good common sense. You need to make sure that your PPE is in place, your N95 is on, uh, that you do a little bit of a leak test on your N95 to make sure it's sealed against your face. Uh, you do want to limit the amount of people going to the patient's side when possible to make sure you have adequate resources to provide the care that you need to, to provide for the patient. And again, the HEPA filter will not save you from aerosolization. Good two-person seal, putting a surgical face mask over the non-rebreather and nasal cannulas, all those sort of things that are put out in the field guide will help you more than the HEPA filter. Number three is the concept of apneic or passive oxygenation. It's okay if you want to avoid bagging a patient for whatever reason, you, you need some time to get your PPE on, you need time to get your N95 secured, um, you are uh, have a patient with a decent respiratory effort who you're kind of on the fence about doing BVM ventilation and you're kind of weighing risk and benefit about doing BVM ventilation and, and causing aerosolization versus just putting on some passive like a non-rebreather. It's okay in this era to err on the side of passive or apneic oxygenation and putting a non-rebreather on a patient's face while you kind of come up with the next step in your airway plan. But remember to, if possible, put in a basic airway adjunct like an OPA or NPA. Number four, Compression pauses frowned upon in the era of high-performance CPR that we came out of pre-COVID, but actually recommended that you do pause compressions when doing an intubation for a COVID patient or a PUI um, to prevent stuff from spewing out of the patient's mouth into the intubator's face. Again, if we're in the world pre-COVID, we never want to interrupt compressions. We want a very high compression fraction, ideally above 80%. COVID era, okay to pause compressions and do your intubation, which brings me to pearl number five. The most expert airway person should be doing the intubation. The, this is a weird situation. We, we have to teach the young, we have to teach the next person that's gonna become a supervisor, we have to teach the paramedic student, and we're gonna to have to figure out ways to do that. But if you have a PUI or a proven COVID patient, you want that tube, if you're gonna put a tube in, you want that tube to go in as quickly as possible. You want it to go in on the first attempt. You want it to go in with video laryngoscopy on the first attempt. And you wanna limit the amount of time that that mouth is gaping open and the airway isn't sealed. 
So we, we can pause compressions when we're doing CPR. If we are intubating, we want the most expert person at the head, ready to go, tube lubricated in the channel of the King Vision, uh, 10 cc syringe attached, full PPE on, imminently ready to swoop in, pause compressions, cross finger technique, mouth wide open, rotate that King Vision in, tube in, inflate the cuff, get on with our lives, continue resuscitation. Most expert person. Number six, unique considerations for pediatric patients. One of the things that we learned from one of our associate medical directors, Jenny Geither, who is um, on our board of medical directors in Baltimore County, is that the HEPA filters, although they look very small to us, actually contain a fair amount of what's called dead space, meaning as we squeeze a pediatric BVM or we squeeze a BVM and give ventilations to a child, there's a fair amount of space in that filter that as you squeeze the bag is filling that filter and not filling a child's lungs. This is particularly important in kids that are less than 10 kilos. So you wanna be careful when you do BVM ventilation with a viral filter in place for a child, particularly a child less than 10 kilos, that you're actually affecting chest rise and fall. And we can talk about that a little bit more later. Number seven, one size doesn't fit all. Early on when, when Sean, Jeff and I were developing this training, we were hearing a lot from providers that, oh, this one supervisor, his approach is he always just puts us in the supraglottic airway, where this one supervisor has decided, I'm never intubating patients anymore. I'm just bagging them the whole way to the hospital. The fact of the matter is, in the hospital and in the pre-hospital environment, there's no such thing as one size fits all. Every patient, every single clinical situation is unique. What has to be used for every single patient is critical thinking. And you can't have the mindset that I'm gonna do it the same way for every patient. Video laryngoscopy, although we recommend it as first line because in the, in the medical literature, there is evidence-based proven better first-rate success with video laryngoscopy. It may not work for everybody. You may have a patient's airway who's swelling up with vomitus or blood or whatever. And every time you dip in the King Vision or your glide scope, there's no windshield wipers on the video devices and you can't see and the suction can't keep up. And in that case, direct laryngoscopy with a yank hour may be the better route. Always use critical thinking, realize one size does not fit all. And what I highly recommend is in these days where we have to be so meticulous about being careful and who's doing what and what position I'm in, and when I withdraw a suction catheter that I'm not splashing somebody, we need to get in the habit of practicing the way we test it for our national registry, which is verbalize everything. Don't, don't make people read your mind when you're at the head managing the airway. Verbalize your plan. It's gonna make you a better airway manager and it's gonna make the situation safer. Um, and, and people want to hear what you're thinking so they can help you, they can anticipate your movements. Number eight, should we be working cardiac arrests at all? That question has come up over and over. And the, the simple answer is yes. In order to have a blanket DNR order that would have to be put out by the state of Maryland, endorsed by the governor, uh, this did uh, exist to some extent in New York and New Jersey, but never existed in the state of Maryland. So the answer is we have to follow our state protocols and our local SOPs. And uh, if a patient is obviously dead, obviously we do not work them. Um, but right now, if you feel that a patient uh, has a chance of being resuscitated and doesn't have a MOLS form that says DNR, DNI, uh, we should be resuscitating patients. When in doubt, look at MOLS forms. When in doubt, engage family or next of kin that's in the, in the room with you and you can always use base station consultation, but we do not have a blanket DNR order for the state of Maryland and our uh, policies and SOPs for who we resuscitate and who we don't resuscitate have not changed. Number nine out of 10, that was nine. Naloxone. So intranasal naloxone uh, will make people sputter, um, especially if you wake them up relatively quickly. Uh, we, we know full well that the police often show up, they give a couple of squirts up the nose, we get there, we're impatient, we wanna do something, we give a squirt up the nose with an atomizer, and then they don't wake up quick enough for us. We give them another squirt. Everybody here that's woken up an opioid overdose knows that these people like to sputter, they like to vomit, they like to cough, and uh, they can be a hot mess. Um, it is uh, not unreasonable uh, in the COVID era to think about using IM Narcan. Uh, it can be given very, very quickly. Uh, if you think that uh, you want to wait for an IV, it's going to take a long time to get an IV usually in these people that might have spent veins and not great venous access. And that's going to be a period of time where you're going to be, have to uh, be doing BVM ventilation. So uh, intranasal Narcan can still be used. IM Narcan in this era is probably preferable. 
Um, and IV is certainly an option, but just remember, you're gonna have to support these patients that have an, an effective respiratory effort with BVM ventilation. And if you're gonna say, hey, I'm gonna do IV all the time because it works quicker. Well, yes, it does work quicker, but you also have to get the IV in. And during that period of time, you're gonna be doing BVM ventilation. Uh, so just be, be ready for these patients to wake up, be ready for them to sputter and cough and vomit, and don't let them do it on you. Figure out a way to cover them or turn their head, have suction ready. Um, and, and then what I've said for years and years is, probably don't need to give everybody a slug of two milligrams of Narcan. Uh, I, in the hospital, when I go to rapid responses for people that have overdosed or been given a too high of a dose of opioid, I titrate it on the microgram level. I give, I give a fraction of a milligram at a time while supporting them until they have a spontaneous respiratory effort and they're not sputtering and they're not coughing. So that's another approach. The last pearl, number 10, is suctioning. Suctioning is probably one of the most dangerous things that we would be doing in the COVID era outside of intubation and other aerosolization procedures. And it really requires meticulous attention to detail. Very often in the heat of battle, we'll intubate somebody, put a, a soft catheter down the ET tube, kind of pull it out and, and the tip will kind of fly around a little bit. And there's all these little particles that we can't see and even more that we can't see. When you suction, whether it be with a yank hour or a red rubber catheter or a soft suction catheter down an ET tube, do any suctioning at all. But you really have to be with everything in this day and age with COVID, just meticulously attentive to detail and move slowly. When you insert the catheter, when you withdraw the catheter, when you kind of put the catheter away, wherever you're gonna put it, you just wanna do it carefully and avoid spraying everybody around you. So I wanted to open up tonight's um, kind of question and answer session with just 10 of these COVID airway pearls that were collected from all of the medical directors. And, and now we kind of invite your questions. And uh, I think we're really lucky that we have two, you know, very accomplished uh, anesthesiologists, anesthesia critical care providers, cardiac anesthesiologist, Dr. Sagel. So uh, you, have, you have a lot of experience up here to take your questions. And uh, the other cool thing is we work in different medical systems. Dr. Baron Holtz at Hopkins, me at uh, GBMC in St. Joe's. And, and Dr. Sagal at Sinai. So you have a nice cross representation from three medical systems that probably have a lot of overlap in their protocols, but, but some unique ways that they navigate through COVID. And uh, I'll just finish by saying, I really wanna thank everybody for logging in tonight, uh, for making these trainings really great, really meaningful. I think we've come a long way in the last few years with Dr. Baron Holtz and Dr. Sagal organizing these EMS Academy lecture series. And uh, we're gonna become the best EMS system in the United States because of this lecture series. So let's open it up to some questions. Thanks, Dave, that's great. Um, so again, uh, for the, those who aren't familiar with Zoom, on the bottom of the screen, bottom of the platform, if you hover over, there's a chat function that'll open up a chat box. For me, it opens up on the right-hand side of the screen. I already sent a video link. This is the video link that we made um, for you. It's available uh, at that site. Uh, and it just reviews a little bit more detail uh, some of these pearls that Dr. Bitberg covered. Um, yeah, something that you're welcome to share with others who aren't able to join. And then as well, this recorded session will be posted as, uh, with the other uh, lecture series as well. So if you wanna add a question, uh, please type it into the chat uh, and make sure you uh, list it to everyone would be my preference. So Sherry wrote, I understand not everyone will intubate, but why not use a less invasive airway on a cardiac arrest, considering the lungs are so fragile uh, uh, or something to that effect. So Sherry, I'm, I'm not entirely sure what your question is, but um, I think I get it. Um, so uh, in my hospital, one of the things that we did early on in COVID was we encouraged our rapid response team if they were responding to a respiratory or even a cardiac arrest to not even consider intubation to actually just start with basic airway management and then quickly move to insertion of a supraglottic airway. In our hospital, we use eye gels. In Baltimore County, we use uh, King uh, LTSD airways. Um, that's actually not a bad option. The prerequisite for putting in a supraglottic airway in Baltimore County is number one, you have to have a relatively unresponsive patient. Two, you have to be open to, able to open up their mouth pretty widely. The King, King LTSD with the two balloons is a pretty, large volume supraglottic airway, and the mouth has to be open sufficiently to insert that and seat that properly uh, and be able to effectively oxygenate and ventilate the patient. 
uh, but that's uh, an A-OK -okay approach. It's something that we recommended at our hospital. And then what we would do is if the patient required ongoing uh, ventilation, we, in a very controlled fashion, would uh, exchange the supraglottic airway, the eye gel, for an ET tube once they got to the ICU. So a little bit of different approach at Hopkins, certainly in the critical care group, we have a number of airway teams that were created to try to standardize the care that's being provided given these exceedingly high risk procedures. Uh, we were advocating for uh, moving pretty quickly to video laryngoscopy and intubation uh, once we had patients, uh, all the providers were in their PPE. So it was very scripted in how people would enter the room, what the, what the, rule, what the roles were when they entered the room. Uh, and we did a lot of um, chest only, hands only CPR. Right, so we put, a, as Dr. Wittberg mentioned, we put a face mask on somebody to encourage kind of passive oxygenation, uh, and then we would try to move as quickly as we possibly could when people had PPE on into the intubation. I think one of the things that definitely came up was the concern that supraglottic airways can has a risk for aspiration. Right, it's not really a, the the gold standard for protecting the airway, but. Uh, I get that there's definitely a risk benefit balance and, and you're seeing that even in hospitals, right, that have thought this out uh, with ex uh, painful detail, many decades, many hours and hours of meetings, uh, we still come up with slightly different uh, recommendations. So I think that's great. Um, gotcha. Do you want to comment on that? I, yeah, I got it. Yeah. So at LifeBridge, uh, we were much very similar to Hopkins. We, uh, they would start with uh, hands-only CPR. And again, we had a dedicated uh, airway teams. Um, we, there's a, there was a lot of risk of aspiration we were finding out very early. So um, we switched to that. And our, the airway teams were all in Pappers. Um, we were very fortunate. We're looking back in the last... 10 plus weeks, um, nobody on any of our response teams has come up COVID positive. But we've also found that, um, especially for people who were, were going down, that the sooner we could get an airway in, the better. And, and they seem to do a little bit better for, for resuscitation. Another thing we found when we were doing RSIs with them, I mean, and the, the, we were trying to pre-oxygenate people who had SATs on, on CPAP or 100%, in the 60s, <clears throat> we couldn't get it up, but they, 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 could, they would code sometimes uh, if we did an RSI within 10 to 15 seconds. So uh, fortunately, again, as Dave was saying, the, we've had the most experienced people in there and our, our average time for laryngoscopy was less than 10 seconds, but uh, patients were, were pretty uh, tenuous at best. So, so I, lo I love uh, one, of, one of the questions that came across the screen from Jason Hoff is, he said, is there a place for prone positioning in EMS? And I think that's a, an awesome question. And I just want to show everybody a picture. Um, and let's, let's see if this, this display is. So, so here, here's a patient's lungs, okay? They're, they're lying in bed. And what happens is, or, or they're lying on your stretcher the top of the lungs near the top of their chest relatively disease free good alveoli the middle moderately diseased the bottom because they've been laying sick in bed for the past few days and then finally called you very very diseased and where does all of the blood flow go when you're lying in bed most of it follows gravity and goes right to the bottom where the lung is very diseased one of the things that we've been using in the icu for years is something called pronation or prone positioning for people with ARDS, Adult Respiratory Distress Syndrome, which many patients with COVID develop. And what we do is we very, very adequately sedate the patient. Sometimes we even paralyze them. And then we flip them onto their stomach so that now their chest is down against the bed and their back is up towards us. And now where does all the blood flow? The blood flow goes to the good portion of the lung and we overcome what's called shunt physiology and we actually deliver more blood to alveoli that are open. And we often see people's oxygen saturations that were profoundly hypoxic pop up immediately. And uh, there's, there was a, a recent study called Proceva that actually showed when you prone people for 16 hours at a time in the ICU that they have better outcomes. So the question posed is, is there a position uh, in EMS, is there a place for pronation in EMS? And I'm gonna tell you the answer is yes. 
there may be, and, and uh, so prone positioning has kind of crept out of the ICU down into the emergency department, and there may be a relatively rare opportunity where there's an opportunity for EMS providers to prone patients. So if, if you have, I'll give you, I'll give you one just great example, kind of separate from COVID and then one related to COVID. I recently went on a call where we picked up a patient who showed us uh, an x-ray report that he had a huge, huge, huge right lung pneumonia and he was hypoxic, his sats were like 70s on room air. We put him on a non-rebreather, they came up to kind of low 80s and his whole right lung was filled with pneumonia. So what position did we put him in when we transported him for about 20 minutes to the hospital? We actually just put some pillows underneath his right side, tilted him onto his left side so that the majority of blood flow was going into the non-pneumonia, non-disease left lungs, and his left lung and his sats went, went way up during the 20 minute transport, uh, way up above the 70% on room air that he came in at, above the 80s that he was on a non-rebreather, it actually went up to about 92% just by tilting him with the good lung down. Um, there may be an opportunity if you pick up a patient with, uh, that's a PUI or a known COVID patient that has relatively refractory hypoxemia that's on a non-rebreather or maybe on non-invasive, um, it's gonna be very challenging to fully prone a patient in the back of a medic unit without, uh, and, and still be able to kind of be very vigilant of what their respiratory effort looks like, keeping them on the monitor, monitoring their airway. So it's probably not a great recommended practice with our short transport times around the beltway, but you could definitely tilt people kind of left and right if they uh, are more comfortable in a certain position. We even in the ICU in patients with COVID, if patients are resistant to proning and getting on their belly, we have them go left and right lateral recumbent uh, every few hours. So I probably recommend that over pronation uh, just because of the difficulties of monitoring patients uh, on the stretcher in the back of the medic unit. Uh, if you ever did do that, and there are critical care transport teams that do this, uh, you wanna put the EKG leads on their back, you wanna turn their head to the side so you can actually see their airway, so that you can suction them if necessary, particularly if their airway isn't protected and intubated. Often we put people in a swimmer position with one arm up and one arm down. Um, pronation sounds easy, but it's actually a skill that takes a little bit of uh, work and teamwork to develop. So I wouldn't recommend full pronation of our patients, but certainly left and right lateral recumbent positions is certainly an option. So, and I would agree with that too. You know, also the thing to consider about proning you know, these sick patients, God forbid, if they were to arrest, uh, yeah, it's a significant thing to get somebody prone, to get somebody supinated uh, and to be able to manage their airway. It's quite complicated. There are whole teams dedicated to proning and unproning patients in the ICU. It's certainly not just, you know, one EMS or two EMS providers in the back of a medic unit, right? It's a whole team uh, that is proning people for that. Uh, there was a question here that came up. I've seen a couple of articles uh, about CDC is not recommending N95 mask exhalation ports on the front. These are the types provided by Baltimore County. Any comments, any plans for a new style N95 mask? Um, I personally think this is a little bit beyond kind of where we're at for this talk. Uh, I know that I, we've seen the articles. Uh, these are the same masks that we're using at Hopkins as well uh, with the exhalation port. Um, I know that our hospital epidemiology group is looking at it too. Uh, certainly if they make a distinction or a differentiation or determination that these masks aren't safe, I, I certainly will pass that all along uh, to the county fire department leadership. Uh, but right now we're using those masks as well. And I think that this is part of, you know, a multi-tiered strategy to help protect providers, right? There's not one strategy that's going to protect providers 100%, right? But rather we're doing multiple things. We're doing the N95, we're doing the, 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 the shields, we're doing the, the HEPA filter. We're trying not to bag people. We're limiting, you know, we're not doing aerosolizations until patients are quite, you know, severe respiratory distress or mild or moderate. So I think there are many things that we are doing uh, and supported by Baltimore County uh, to uh, help decrease the risk for providers. Um, yeah, we'll certainly share any information that we get about these N95 masks uh, as that uh, continues to be investigated. So there's an interesting question from uh, Coase Hamburger about any research being done on the utility of hyperbaric medicine on profoundly hypoxic COVID patients. So I'll, I'll let you know what, what we do at GBMC and then and we'll turn it over to Sean and, and Jeff. We, for those of you that don't know, we actually have a hyperbaric uh, uh, system at GBMC. We have um, a number of monoplace chambers. 
Uh, so these are chambers that you can put one patient in at a time and only the patient can fit in and a provider cannot. Whereas larger tertiary care centers uh, like Maryland, Shock Trauma, uh, have multi-place chambers where you can put multiple patients in with a provider like a nurse or a doctor. Um, so I, I just pulled up the latest email from my director of hyperbaric medicine at my hospital, and he sends us kind of updates uh, regularly. And, and right now there's really, to cut to the chase, there's insufficient evidence to endorse the routine use of hyperbaric oxygen for COVID-19 outside of uh, IRB approved research, uh, which I know is actually going on uh, down at Maryland. I've actually sent one patient there for that. Um, there is a theoretical benefit of hyperbarics. Hyperbarics will dramatically increase your PO2, your partial pressure of oxygen in your bloodstream. Uh, it also has anti-inflammatory effects. Uh, but right now, outside of research protocols, I'm not aware uh, at my institution uh, or Maryland of any active um, treatment algorithms that involve hyperbarics. John from Hopkins, we're not participating in any trials around hyperbarics. Uh, just for those who are interested, for the hospitalized patients who are profoundly hypoxic, uh, despite uh, aggressive care, 100% FiO2, PEEP, normal paralysis, uh, and some other strategies, uh, the next step is ECMO, where we put catheters in patients, uh, a couple of different places, a couple of different options, to circulate a patient's blood through an artificial membrane and to oxygenate them and then to return that oxygenated blood back to the, to the, um, to the body. Um, this has been evaluated in a number of different cases over the decades, uh, certainly as an, a, um, an extreme measure of something that we do. Um, I don't know about efficacy or any reports quite yet uh, for the use of ECMO with um, uh, COVID. Uh, more to come, I'm sure. Great question, Coast. I just wanted to go back to something that Dr. Sagal said earlier. You know, Dr. Sagal and Dr. Baronholtz talked about uh, hands-only CPR and a dedicated uh, anesthesia, usually anesthesia-led airway team. And <clears throat> um, I recently did a case review uh, where there was a uh, PUI um, and the patient was um, intubated by a student. And it, it, needless to say, it didn't go so well, and that's why we did a case review. Um, and what I told everybody at that case review was, I've been doing airway management for years. I consider myself somewhat expert at airway management. But when I needed to intubate a patient in my ICU, I stepped out of the way and I let our expert anesthesia airway team come in and do it uh, because they trained, they, they had a good system, they knew how to protect themselves, uh, they knew how to protect uh, the, the, the whole team from being exposed to aerosols. They also had a, what we call the officer, a dedicated person monitoring, donning and doffing uh, that came as a unique entity of that anesthesia airway team. And so when, when we give the guidance that the most expert person should be managing the airway, it, it floats all the way to the top. Uh, it floats up to the highest ranks in the hospital. We step aside and we let people that are most expert do what they're expert at. And uh, there's good reason for that. And one of the luxuries that we have in the hospital, of course, is uh, facilitated intubation or rapid sequence intubation, where we can basically sneak up on a patient quickly, induce them and paralyze them, and they no longer sputter and like Dr. Sagal said, get a tube in in seconds. Uh, we, we fully realize that, that that is not an option in the field outside of the Maryland State Police right now. Um, and so you are at a disadvantage that you don't have the same tools that we have in the hospital and you can't paralyze a patient and prevent them from coughing on you. Uh, and that's why I think it is just, uh, you know, extremely challenging to manage airways in the EMS realm. Um, you have to be exquisitely careful with uh, not rushing in and donning your PPE and making sure your N95 and particularly your eyes are covered. Um, and then really using critical thinking about whether or not to get invasive or not. Uh, are you gonna try to pry open that patient's mouth, put in a video laryngoscope, or are you gonna kind of just sit tight and do uh, apneic oxygenation, passive oxygenation, or two-person BVM ventilation with the nasopharyngeal airway? Uh, it's challenging and, and we get that. And um, so we applaud you for working through this difficult time. So I just want to add to that because this came up too, and I just want to comment. We you know, we can't underemphasize enough the importance of oxygenation, right? So typically, you know, we talk about three to five minutes of oxygenation before we vet, before we intubate people. We don't always do that, right? Even in the hospital, we don't always do that. But in this patient population, when they have such low reserve, right? We've had many patients arrest during intubation 
So you've got, we've got to, to, to really hyperoxygenate. Uh, when our bedside nurses and the teams are calling for intubation within our organization at Hopkins Hospital, on the checklist, one of the first thing is place the patient on 100% FiO2. So while the page is going out, while the team is responding, while the team is donning their PPE, while the team's getting organized, that patient is already on 100% FiO2. Um, so I just want to re really emphasize, because that is something that we can do in the field, is to really oxygenate people up and, and not take that for granted. So going back to, again, Dr. Sadel, he, he had mentioned the, the relatively higher rate of peri-intubation cardiac arrest. Uh, it's a very real thing. Um, these are very sick people. They have uh, zero reserve usually. Uh, like Dr. Barinholt said, the importance of pre-oxygenation cannot be uh, understated. Uh, one of the most difficult uh, situations that I've been involved with during uh, the past few months treating many patients with COVID has been uh, taking care of a, of a young man uh, in his 30s. Uh, his only risk factor was morbid obesity, which is actually emerging as one of the major risk factors for contracting COVID, symptomatic COVID, and progressing to severe COVID, uh, much more so than many other risk factors out there like diabetes, high cholesterol, and other diseases. Uh, and I tried to avoid intubating him for as long as I could. I had him on a vapotherm, also known as an optiflow, you know, a nasal cannula that, that could deliver 40 liters per minute, 100% FiO2, and then I put him on non-invasive, and then he just started to tire out. He became confused. It was very clear that his CO2 was rising. I called our anesthesia airway team. I turned his care uh, over to the anesthesiologist and, and kind of stood outside the door, watching them in their pappers with their full PPE, intubating him. They did everything right. They pre-oxygenated him uh, for about 10 minutes as they prepared their plan and verbalized their plan to each other to keep each other safe. Um, they started their thinking about the post-intubation management plan before they in, even intubated the patient. And uh, they uh, pushed an induction agent, a paralytic, they intubated him, everything looked like it went okay, and as soon as they walked away, uh, he just he just braided down, became bradycardic. And then I had the very difficult decision, like most of you, as to whether or not to perform CPR. Slightly different position being in the hospital making that decision, with uh, a lot more autonomy and working under my own medical license. Uh, but I had to weigh the risk of bringing in five, six folks from my IC staff to do CPR on, on what I considered at that point to probably be a futile resuscitation effort in somebody who I knew had gotten maximum support for his respiratory disease, but I wound up coding anyway. Uh, we wound up resuscitating him because of how young he was and, and kind of the emotions uh, of the staff. We didn't want to watch a young man die, but uh, the incidents of peri-intubation, cardiac arrest are well reported in COVID. They're significantly higher than in non-COVID patients, and therein lies the importance of meticulous critical thinking, pre-planning, verbalizing your plan. Uh, sometimes less is more, and when in doubt, going down the route of basic airway management is not always a bad idea. There's a question that I'm not sure how to answer, maybe others may. How does induced hypothermia help with trouble breathing? I find it easier to breathe in the winter. Is it better addressed as a humidity control? So, so I'm not sure that induced hypothermia helps with trouble breathing. I, I think that, you know, we certainly induce hypothermia after a cardiac arrest because there have been large international studies suggesting that what is called targeted temperature management, where we lower a patient's temperature uh, with very uh, concrete goals for definitive periods of time, can improve neurological outcome. Uh, it's not a strategy that we typically do around somebody who is not oxygenating well. Uh, we would not induce hypothermia for that. So I don't know if that, Whitney, answers your question or if some of the others may want to chime in. Um, one of the things I noticed, and Dave will chime in on this, I remember for on emergency medicine stuff, especially during the winter, you have a child who's having an asthma attack in the house. The parent takes them, finally makes a decision to take them to the hospital by the time they get to the hospital, the attack's been broken because of the cold air. You used to see that a lot. Yep. And it's like, should I have come? Yeah. And I mean, Dave, you've, you've, I'm sure you've seen the same thing. So, so it, it's interesting. Number one, the first interesting thing is that question was posed by Whitney Houston. I believe the children are our future. Teach them well and let them lead the way. So thank you, Whitney, for, for being at this training. Um, number two, um, it, uh, you know, uh, it's interesting, when, when we put people on mechanical ventilators in the ICU, 
we actually usually humidify the circuit and we warm it up a little bit and it actually breaks up secretions and uh, makes airflow a little more or less turbulent, more laminar. So we actually move a little bit in the opposite direction. But to echo what Dr. Barenholt said, um, there are indications for what are called targeted temperature management, where we cool people with either intravascular catheters or by putting wraps around the body to, to controlled, in a controlled fashion, lower their temperature. The, the usual indication is uh, a ROSC after cardiac arrest. It used to be just for VF or VT. Now we typically cool all survivors of cardiac arrest that are comatose. Uh, and then uh, there are certain uh, neurocritical care ICUs that I've worked in uh, where we cool people with uh, traumatic brain injury and subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, but we don't routinely cool people purely for um, respiratory failure. That, that just isn't described in the medical literature right now. And I'll just share, because I know that you guys are always interested in kind of, you know, different perspectives. You know, it's interesting in the hospital date, Dr. Bitberg had mentioned about humidification of the circuit. You know, I think many organizations at the onset of COVID were very worried about humidifying the circuit because of the risk of aerosolization. And I know Hopkins, certainly, we were not humidifying the circuit. And we had a whole series of bad events because the endotracheal tube would get blocked with mucus and secretions that because we, weren't aeros because we weren't humidifying those gases, uh, they would get very dried out and they would call what we call concretions. And there were a number of emergency reintubations that had to occur uh, because of this. And, and now we definitely have gone away from that and now we're humidifying the circuit yet again, just like we did prior to COVID. Sean or Jeff, could you comment? Uh, Ken or Dill, uh, Cecil County paramedic asked. Um, they have that one I can, I was involved in that. Um, read it for the actually, so. Jeff, so we have an optional protocol, uh, RSI in Cecil County. Would you have any recommended changes to the procedure pre, para, post intubation that you would recommend? When, let me get my, all right. So when we were looking at the turning it from um, a, an evaluation to releasing the RSI protocol, we literally went through it line by line. So actually we made the changes. Um, if, you, if you were one of the jurisdictions that was using this as a, a trial, you'll notice for adults, for example, uh, lidocaine was dropped. Uh, although it's still present for the pediatric group, but it's 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 very debatable. But lidocaine, part of the RSI included lidocaine that was dropped from the adults. Um, drug doses were changed. Uh, midazolam was added. So, and it gave you a little more variety of a choice, uh, whether atomidate versus ketamine versus midazolam. So that was the change. Is this COVID related, Jeff, or those are just yeah. changes? So this, was, this was, well, it's interesting that the RSI protocol just got released. For the last 10 years, it was, um, it was under evaluation. Yeah. So this, it was, we had these meetings actually um, were, were last fall, pre-COVID. So not all the decisions were made before, but um, now in relation to the RSI, well, it's, it's obviously changed in that we weren't bagging them. We were doing the apneic oxygenation and then putting the tube in, and then we have filters uh, on the viral filters on. Another thing you, we were seeing is we were getting rid of um, nebulizers. Yeah. So. Yeah, so can I just clarify that? So I think that Jeff and I, you know, Dave, we've talked about this before for sure. I think we're all on the same page about this, most hospitals. You know, so with RSI, we definitely, you know, the same criteria we RSI, most of these PUIs for sure. Uh, we pre-oxygenate really well. Um, sometimes we'll even leave a nasal cannula on for those who have been through Dr. Bitberg and Dr. Sagel's airway management uh, program. Um, what we've been advocating for is to keep that nasal cannula on uh, so the process would be to pre-oxygenate, you induce with some sedative agent, and then after that, because it's an RSI, we're not bagging, right? So there's definitely aptic oxygenation there, uh, and then that could last for, you know, 15 to 60 seconds, right, depending upon what medication you're opting to use. Um, and then once that time is up, so there's no bagging uh, during that time, then the intubation occurs. And then we hook it, uh, we've been practicing hooking it up directly to the ventilator with the filter on board uh, as not to bag the patient again. We don't have that option in the field, so I think more applicable would just be make sure that we're using that viral filter and obviously the end tidal monitor. So I think those are the biggest things is not, not um, bagging people after induction but before oxygenation and making sure that we uh, really oxygenate patients well before we undergo this 
uh, procedure. Anybody have anything else to add? I typed in my notes uh, that one, one of the things that I recommend is, is sometimes um, novice airway managers, even some of the physicians that I work with that don't do a lot of airway stuff, tend to tiptoe into the dosing of their medications for RSI. This is not the time to do that. If you're going to do RSI, you want to commit, you want to dose your patients appropriately. The, uh, RSI would be a whole other you know, multi-hour lecture, but you want to make sure that your induction agent induces the patient into unconsciousness quickly and you wanna make sure that your paralytic is dosed uh, to the uh, patient's weight uh, on the higher end and that it exerts its effect and uh, that when you go to open their mouth and insert whatever airway device you're using, uh, that you're getting it in and getting uh, successfully, uh, the patient successfully integrated the first time. Um, so avoidance of underdosing of your medications, um, very, very quick movement to usually a closed circuit, like Dr. Barinholt said, we would pre-prepare our ventilators all completely attached with inline suctioning uh, settings uh, dialed up. Uh, that way, as soon as the tube went in, uh, we could basically almost crimp the tube and then hook up the ventilator and then let go. And there's a completely closed circuit and, and no aerosolization into the environment. Uh, you know, so so people are probably listening to this and going, well, "Who cares? I, I'm on the back of a medic unit." Uh, well, there's direct application to what you do if you intubate patients, and that is, if you do decide to intubate a patient, one of the probably easiest things you can do is uh, assign roles to folks around you that are assisting you. And as soon as that tube goes in and you are inflating that cuff, you have another person hooking up the top of the stem of the BVM right to the top of that ET tube instantaneously. So a lot of the times we get the tube in, somebody's holding it, there's a, few, a, a moment or two seconds, sometimes even longer that elapses. Again, a lot of, a lot of what we're talking about right now comes back to meticulous attention to detail. And, and if you can assign roles, you can limit that time. You can shave your times down between when the tube goes in, cuffs inflated, and the top of that BVM is reattached. How many times have all of the ALS providers on this call intubated a patient, and then you go to pick up the BVM and the mask is still on, and you have to take on the mask, take off the mask, and then you, you have to attach it to the ET tube, but because of secretions or whatever, it's a little bit of a mess, or the O2 tubing is tangled up around the patient's feet, you get what I'm saying. Be meticulous, pre-plan everything, assign roles, and limit the amount of time that there's an open circuit. The other thing too is an ET tube. Once that's in, that little pipe is a great conduit for increased pressures and increased spewage into the environment. We've, I think all, if you've been in this game long enough, we've all seen people um, that have aspirated, uh, kind of begin to, or, or with frothy pulmonary edema, start to spew out the end of an ET tube. That's the last thing we want. We want the BVM immediately attached to the top of the ET tube with a viral filter in between. Thanks, Dave. That's a great list in the chat. Uh, Sherry asked, do we have any photos of the injured lungs from a COVID patient when the tube needed to be changed because of not aerosolization? So sorry if I misspoke. So uh, what happens is because of the endotracheal tube doesn't, uh, there's no humidification, the secretions build up in the endotracheal tube. And I think that if you were to Google, for example, endotracheal tube concretions, C-O-N, whatever that is, sorry, concretions, as opposed to secretions, but concretions, I think there are a million pictures. I don't think that there's anything unique about COVID with that. And I don't know that necessarily it hurts the lungs. Typically what happens is that, you know, the patients all of a sudden, you know, tr start triggering their high pressure alarms on their ventilator and they're not oxygenating and ventilating. So they can become uh, pretty hypoxic pretty fast. And then we all know, you know, once that happens, take patients off the ventilator and then you bag to try to identify where the problem is. And then when you go to bag these patients, there's no air movement because that tube has all these secretions in it. So I'm sorry, I don't have any pictures, but that is kind of what I was, uh, what, what the experience that we were having uh, around the lack of humidification. And I don't think that it happens immediately. I don't know if it happens in days or weeks, but I don't think that it's within minutes or hours. I think that this is a, a couple of days into a week that we start to really see these problems. Any other questions from uh, BLS airway, ALS airway, other? I'm just still honored Whitney Houston is here. That's amazing. <laughs> We've resurrected Whitney. Please expand the role of the DOF, or DOF officer. So the, right. Yeah, so I thought this, this was cutesy, but it's actually more than cutesy. It's actually safe. 
good safe practice. So uh, very early, uh, so, so let me fast forward. One of the things that I tell my team whenever I do my group meetings for my ICU now is I always finish my meetings by saying complacency breeds failure. And it's, it's, COVID hasn't been around long, but it's been around long enough where some of us were getting tired of it. Look, look at society, we wanna get back to work, we wanna to go to the pool, uh, I want the mall to open so that my wife gets out of the house for five minutes. Like we wanna get back to our lives. And, and with that, uh, in the hospital and in the EMS realm, um, there's a tendency to become complacent and, and then not wear your mask around a fire station and um, not necessarily have your N95 on as you walk into a house. And, and that's where you're gonna start to see this, you know, the, 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 the subsequent peaks in disease, both in our patients and, and in, unfortunately, our team members, our, our, our providers. Um, so you, you don't become complacent. Uh, the officer is a role that emerged early on in my hospital, which is a dedicated, it's actually usually a scrub nurse from the operating room uh, who travels along with the airway team. And their singular mission is to watch all the airway folks getting on their PPE, make sure that they put on everything properly, make sure their N95 is completely sealed and they do a little negative pressure test, make sure their eye protection is on, make sure that their gown comes up above their neck, make sure their gloves go over the cuffs of their gown. And more importantly, on the way out of the room, that they use an alcohol-based hand rub over their gloves before they take their gloves off, that um, everything is just done in a slow, controlled, as I've said before on this call, meticulous fashion, so that everybody goes home healthy and stays healthy. And so we call that our officer. And we actually had, uh, when our airway team was 24-7, they, they, they went around the hospital and, and responded to all the airway uh, calls for airway assistant with the officer. And again, this isn't, uh, we're, we're not having these EMS trainings to talk about what we do in the hospital. We're all EMS physicians. Jeff, Sean, and I have all been doing EMS for years. We ride in the back of the medics now, and, and we know what you do and, and what we do. Um, and there's direct applicability to having a officer, even on a two-person crew, a paramedic EMT crew or a two paramedic crew. You can be the officer for your partner. Um, make, make sure that um, you know you, you check each other out, um, and, and as they say um, in a journal article that I read, check yourself before you wreck yourself. Mm. I like that. But on the fire, on the fire side, this was the safety officer. Exactly. Yeah, and Hopkins, um, just to share another institution's perspective, so we have safety officers too. We have one at the entrance of every COVID uh, unit in our hospital and one at the exit zone of every COVID unit at the hospital who are there 24 seven. And their role is everybody who enters that unit gets checked before they go in and then they get checked when they come out. And I definitely think that, you know, I would just reemphasize one thing that Dr. Wittberg kind of snuck in there, which I think is a really good practice that probably is gonna to continue to stay. There's definitely this practice of using alcohol-based gel on top of your gloves, right? So when you come out of an EMS call, when you're done, as you're beginning to doff your PPE, the first step then would be to put alcohol based on your, on your gloves, right? On top of your gloves. And then work on taking off your gown or, or taking down your, your MRF suit, um, whatever you guys are using for PPE. I know it varies a little bit by station. And again, I just want to reemphasize that during, you know, we definitely, when the case is, when the call is over, I get it, everyone, there's a million things to do. That is the most important time where you just need to pause, right? We can't be filling out reports, we can't be stocking, right? We can't be doing any of that, right? Those people on the call watch each other and make sure each other completely doffs their PPE in a very safe way. Uh, it's definitely a, a, a period where we could be a little bit anxious, they keep moving on, and that's one of the highest risk things. So I think that we definitely could have somebody keep an eye on us and, and help us make sure that we're doing things meticulously uh, right. Great. I would take that a step further, Sean. Um, one of the things that we talked about in our airway training that I know you're intimately familiar with is the benefit of a checklist in high acuity situations. And um, there's obviously uh, been a lot of research that's come out of Hopkins and I know the Armstrong Institute, which you're involved with regarding the um, safety benefits and improved patient outcomes uh, when checklists are used. And it's something that I've started to try to bring into uh, Baltimore County EMS when we've done our airway training. One of the things that I, I gave the uh, EMS officers that rotated through the airway training uh, was both a airway checklist and then when we did bougie training, a bougie checklist. And it, it's, it's never a bad idea 
Uh, the, the fire side, I think, does this a lot better than us. Um, I think it's never a bad idea, especially on a medical, medical box call, uh, when there may be seven, eight people there and, and an extra set of hands. Or imagine this, the supervisor could actually just sit back and supervise and not do hands-on skills. That the person who's kind of a, a few feet removed from the patient's uh, body actually serves as a safety officer. And, and whether it be for uh, a checklist for good airway management or a checklist for donning and doffing, um, I think it's something that uh, we should start to look at uh, more seriously uh, using on a regular basis for a lot of calls, whether it be treating a tachyarrhythmia, cardioverting a patient, treating hypotension. We do have protocols. They are guides, uh, but, but checklists work a little bit better. Uh, just as we wait for more chats, I sent around in the chat function a sign-in sheet. There's a link there. If you click on that link or copy that into your browser, an Excel file will open. If you enter your name, your LOSAP MIMS number, uh, I'll make sure that you get MIMS uh, CEUs for attending the training. One of the things that um, I would like to encourage, you know, obviously by being on this call, you've already selected yourself uh, as, as being a little further along uh, academically in the EMS community. You're obviously joining us on a beautiful yet slightly humid uh, summer evening. Um, a lot of what we're talking about is actually been learned on the fly over the last two to three months. Um, a, a lot of the things that we've recommended and a lot of the things that we've told you tonight are based in, in evidence-based medicine that have been around forever, but have been adapted in, in a big way uh, with regard to COVID. Uh, it, it, there's a lot of room for publication in GEMS, EMS world, pre-hospital emergency care. Pick, pick your journal or your, your magazine. Um, I would encourage anybody that's interested in writing about their experience, be it a uh, clinical experience or a skill set that they've developed or a workaround that they've developed to make things safer. Um, I'm happy to work with you. I know any one of the three of us would be happy to work with you on that. Um, just feel free to reach out. I don't see any other comments in the chat. I want the guy in the police car to come just drive by and arrest my wife, Tigger. I don't know. <laughs> uh, CSA, I don't know who you are, but it looks like you got a cage behind your head. Oh, and the pictures. <laughs> no, okay, it's not happening. That's okay. I'm over it. Okay, you guys. Well, again, thank you as always for your commitment to lifelong learning, right? Um, yeah, we're very grateful for what you guys do every day. We're with you. We want to support you. Please reach out to us if there are any issues or comments. Uh, if there are great cases that you would like us to review, we have a very active uh, Zoom review process that could be go through your district officers. Um, uh, they may need some reminding about this, but just remind them that Dr. Wittberg in particular said, yeah, submit these cases. Um, and then we can uh, do a Zoom review for any of these cases. We had a lot of cases, one to two a week, I would say, prior to COVID. And we know these patients are equally as difficult, but yet we're not getting the same responses. So if you had a case that you want us to review, no matter how big, how small, um, you know, please reach out to us. We'd be happy to join you and your company and those who were on the call to kind of hear your thoughts on this and to help you work out and work through uh, maybe some questions that you had about the call. Um, yeah, we, we want to support you in that way. Uh, Dr. Wittberg, any closing comments? No, nope. uh, just I really appreciate everybody taking the time to be here. Um, I really appreciate uh, Dr. Baron Holtz for putting together the EMS lecture series. I really appreciate him being uh, the brains behind the IT part of this as well. And there are actually some folks that support him in that that I want to say thank you to uh, that produced our video and work with him uh, at Station 32 when we do lectures there. I'm very grateful uh, for them. And I'm very grateful for Dr. Sagel for providing Baltimore County with an opportunity that simply doesn't exist anywhere else in the United States right now, which is actually uh, advanced airway management training on actual, wait for it, humans. Uh, that, that opportunity simply doesn't exist in many other very, very high caliber EMS systems. So I think um, we're, I'm just very fortunate to be surrounded by a lot, a lot of uh, EMS physicians that are very dedicated to uh, making our uh, team a, a true high performance team. Thanks for your leadership, Dr. Bitberg. Great. All right, everyone, stay safe. Thank you so much. Good night.